My name is Dave, and I'm sitting in my room. I've made four phone calls and sent one text message in the last two hours to ruin God knows how many lives. Someone's at the door. Hey, sweetie, where's Fiona? I called Stuart, and he came home early. He's going to pick her up and keep an eye on her until I get home. Linda, I've said it before, but I'll say it again. He's a great guy. I know it's a tradition not to like your son-in-law, but your choice is so damn good I just can't help but like him. I grinned at my daughter's grim smile. We shared a sense of humor. Have you told Pete yet, Dad? No, your brother is at sea right now. I'll write him later. Okay, Dad, I'm here for you, you know that. Yes, thank you, sweetheart. We were silent for a long time. Why did she do that to you, Daddy? I don't know, honey. Why didn't she say anything? Um, I haven't talked to her yet. You mean to tell me that they're still... Uh-huh. I saw my daughter's worried eyes dart toward the bedroom stairs. I just wanted to wait so she could tell us all at the same time why she did it. All of us? Yeah, I invited a few more guests. They'll be here soon. What are you gonna do? No more or less than it takes to get through this. So you have a plan already? I do. It's not up to her? No, the facts speak for themselves. The cause is irrelevant. But she could have been blackmailed. Believe me, if you saw what I saw and heard what I heard, you'd realize she wasn't being blackmailed. Linda looked into my eyes for a moment. I thought you were taking it normally, but now I see that you weren't. I didn't. I looked away. No daughter should ever have to see her father cry. What would you have me do? You do what your conscience tells you to do. I won't think any better or worse of you, no matter what you decide. Thank you, Dad. Do you have any idea why she did it? I have no idea, honey. Until this morning, I thought we had a good marriage. What happened this morning? Well, your mother's always been bad at lying and keeping secrets. It's just not in her nature. After 27 years together, I know her habits like my own. She showers every morning. Every Tuesday and Friday, she washes her hair. She is in there for about 30 minutes. This morning, she spent almost an hour and a half in there. When I walked in there to tell her she was going to be late for work, I saw what kind of underwear she was wearing and what she was going to wear. It wasn't her usual office clothes. I asked her what her plans were for the day, and she said it was nothing out of the ordinary, just work. She was lying. Every time she thought she was going to be late for work, she started to worry. This morning, she was as cold as a cucumber. That's when I realized she wasn't going to work. So what did you do? I canceled work and parked a little further down the street. I was going to follow her when she left, but she wasn't going anywhere. I stayed there until the guy she works with at the real estate agency showed up around 11.30. I snuck in and made sure it was exactly what I expected, and then started thinking about what I should do. After that, I made a few phone calls, and here we are. Were there any leads, Dad? I mean, before today? I thought you were doing okay. No, honey, nothing. As far as I knew, I loved her, and she loved me. We were gonna work a few more years and then retire and live happily ever after. Daddy, I have to ask you something. Did you ever- Don't even say it, Linda. No, I never betrayed your mother. I've never disrespected a woman so much in my life. Even when our sex life pretty much died a couple years ago, I just let it go. What, you haven't had sex in two years? No, your mother was never overtly sexual. She just didn't seem to enjoy it very much. Sure, she seemed to enjoy it when we started, but that was in the beginning. When she went through menopause two years ago, everything just completely dried up. So when you found her today, it must have hit you hard. I let my steely gaze answer that for me. At that moment, there was another quiet knock on the door. I opened it and saw my father-in-law standing there. Come in, Paul. Thanks, Dave. Where is she? Upstairs in our bedroom. Uh, okay. I'll have to see for myself. I understand. Just don't disturb her, please. The old man went up the stairs and came down a minute later looking even older. He sank heavily into a chair. I poured him a whiskey and he drank it down. I can't believe she would do that to you. She knows how devastated you were when your fiancé cheated on you. After all, she helped pick up your pieces. Not only that, she knows how devastated I was when I caught her mother when she ran off with that this asshole, leaving me and the kids behind. I'm sorry, but I have to get out of here. I guess a woman shouldn't see her grandfather crying. 
I walked him to the door. Linda pretended like she was going to follow us, but I waved her off. I wanted the old man to retain the remnants of his pride. He stood on the porch and grabbed my shoulders for support. Do what you have to do, son, but nothing physical. I couldn't stand there and watch this. Don't worry, Dad. I won't touch a hair on your daughter's head. But as for the other shit, I apologize for what I'm about to do. A guy's got to do what he's got to do. He looked at me for a long time, then nodded. He shuffled to his car and slowly drove away, a broken man. I called his son, my wife's brother, and without going into details, suggested he go to his father's house for support. I was just hanging up the phone when I heard the toilet flush upstairs. Ah, nap time must be over. I joined Linda, and for a few minutes we sat in silence. Soon we heard the creaking of the bed and the sounds of passion. See, Linda, does this look like blackmail to you? No, Dad. How can you sit there? Why don't you go kick that bastard's ass? Well, it's not easy, honey, but I have the ability to shut off my emotional side, sort of disconnect from all my feelings. So why torture yourself? Why not go upstairs and stop it? Throw the whore out. Um, we have another visitor. As if on cue, there was another knock on the door. I opened to a sensible lady a few years younger than me. Surprisingly, she had a boy and a girl with her. They looked like teenagers. Is this Mr. Brown? Yes, please, call me Dave. I'm Jenny Smith, and these are my children, Robert and Sarah. I picked them up from school. If what you say is true, I wanted them here. If only to realize that it was their father who destroyed our family. I shook Robert's hand. It was surprisingly firm. I introduced them all to Linda. You said you had proof, Dave. In response, I reached into my pants on the armrest of the couch and pulled out my wallet. I held it out to Jenny. She opened it and looked at the driver's license. A tear rolled out of her eye. She must have hoped what I'd said on the phone was a mistake. Her face was suddenly petrified. Well, Dave, where are they? In response, I simply put my finger to my lips in the international symbol of silence. We sat there listening to the grunts and groans. Son of a bitch. You haven't run into them yet? No, I wanted us to act as a team. I just made a video for us that I'm happy to share. I also set up a tape recorder and stuck it under the bed. We can go right now if you want. I suggest the kids wait until we meet up with, uh, worthy performers. Yeah, you're right. Wait a minute, I have a locksmith to change the locks on my house. I was just waiting to see if you were right. I'm not really surprised. It's not the first time. He's such a smooth, talking little foo. Dang. Linda and I waited patiently while she called the locksmith, then her lawyer and gave them both permission. We distracted her kids from the noise by talking about nothing. Then Jenny squared her shoulders. All right, let's go. Jenny, Linda, and I climbed the stairs while the kids downstairs waited for our signal. After Jenny peered furtively through the doorway, I gestured for them to stay away and entered the room myself. I stood at the foot of the bed and watched in disgust. What I had seen before was true missionaryism. Now he was taking it doggy style. I watched impassively as he thrust into her. She showed her appreciation with continuous moans. She refused to have doggy sex with me shortly after the wedding, said it was degrading. Suddenly she shrieked and collapsed on the bed. He let her rest for a moment, then resumed the action. She rolled over onto her back and her eyes met mine. Her face stretched and she cried out. Her lover followed her gaze and saw me too. Rising to his feet, he stopped and looked at my face. I could see that he had a very bad feeling about his physical safety in the near future. That's right, asshole. I'm bigger and uglier than you, and please believe me, I'm pissed as hell. Why don't you just go back to bed and cover yourself and my ex-wife? He was an obedient bastard, if nothing else. Within seconds, they were already lying side by side under the covers. I noticed that the look on Tracy's face went from shock to defiance. I let her speak first. Uh, Dave, I want a divorce. I'm in love with Joe, this guy. I'm sorry you had to find out like this. We were gonna tell you tomorrow. It's okay, honey. By the way, I know his name is John Smith, don't I? I could see they were shocked. Not the smartest move, leaving your wallet in your pants pocket downstairs, asshole. Tracy, just idle curiosity, but why did you end our marriage like that? You had to know that catching you cheating would devastate me. Finally, I saw the shame on her face. I'm so sorry, Dave. We couldn't help falling for each other. I accept that, darling. 
but you could have not put the cart before the horse. You could have not fucked that asshole before you announced you wanted a divorce, couldn't you? I'm sorry, Dave. I just wanted to make sure John and I were compatible. We didn't want you to see us. If it helps, it was the first time. What, a test drive of a new model? A size test? Don't be rude, Dave. I don't want our marriage to end in a fight. Can't we break up as friends? That almost broke through my mental defenses. I assume that under the pressure of this situation, it's like she's quoting tomorrow's pre-rehearsed speech. You've got to be fucking kidding me. We stared at each other until Tracy lowered her eyes. I decided it was time to start scoring. Your father wanted me to tell you how disappointed he is. He had hoped you wouldn't turn out to be a slut like your mother. Tracy's face turned white as a sheet. Yeah, I called him. I'm surprised you haven't seen him. He was just standing here half an hour ago. Why? Because, bitch, I wanted you to start feeling the same pain I've been feeling since that asshole showed up. I don't know what the kids would think of that. Oh, God, Dave, please don't tell the kids, please. Sorry, honey, too late. Linda took this moment to appear in the doorway. Tracy took one look, shrieked, and hid her face under the sheet. Don't worry, Mom, it doesn't work for ostriches, and it won't work for you. Tracy just moaned under the sheet. Her bed partner continued to look very uncomfortable. When Dad called me, I questioned it. I just couldn't believe you would do that to him. Now I understand why he called me. If I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I might have convinced him to forgive you, but seeing you like this, I know that will never happen. Silence, save for deep, agonizing sobs, was the only answer. Well, Mom, if you have nothing more to say, I'll say it all. We don't need you babysitting your granddaughter this weekend. In fact, if cutting her off from seeing her protects her from your poisonous influence, then you can kiss her goodbye once. From beneath the sheet came a pitiful, no. Now Linda was sobbing herself. You should have seen the look on poor old grandpa's face. You devastated him. She turned to run, but I grabbed her and hugged her. She broke free and ran downstairs. Soon we all heard the front door slam. A few more minutes passed before Tracy reappeared with red eyes. Why did you do that, Dave? Because you haven't yet experienced half the pain that I have, Tracy. You haven't felt your heart ripped out and stomped on. But you'll get it, I assure you. Now I've had enough of this charade, just get out of my house, both of you. A defiant expression reappeared on Tracy's face. If anyone is going to leave this house, it's going to be you. I use the power of attorney you gave me just in case something happened to you to transfer the documents into my name only. I think the hotness of her own voice even surprised Tracy. She could certainly see in my face that by revealing yet another of her betrayals, she had pissed me off even more. She also realized that morally, she was just digging her own grave deeper and deeper. I quickly came to my senses. It's a strange thing with shocking news. It stops hurting so much when it reaches a certain point. I reached that point two hours ago. How are you going to pay your mortgage, Tracy? You think you and I haven't figured it out, Dave? With my salary and commission and John, we'll be fine. What are you talking about, Tracy? Your boss, Mr. Johnson, told me to tell you both that you're fired. He would have told you himself, but apparently both phones are disconnected. Good Christian soul that he is, he had a vague idea of two married assholes like you cheating during work hours. You didn't tell him, Dave. Tell me you didn't. Uh-huh, and sent him some nice pictures. Tracy's bedmate had finally found his voice. How do you know I'm married? Do you remember your driver's license? Phone book, cell phone easy, wife Jenny about 5'6", pretty redhead, kids Robert and Sarah look like good kids. Tell me, asshole, were you planning on fucking them the way that bitch was planning on fucking me? Please, Mr. Brown, don't tell my wife. Why not? Aren't you done emptying all your bank accounts, getting ready to sail off into the sunset with my wife? She's getting the house. Just give me a chance to tell her gently, please. She doesn't deserve this. I, I still love her in my own way. She doesn't deserve to find out. What, she doesn't? Yeah, you're right. Unfortunately, it's too late. I didn't need to turn around to know exactly when Jenny and her kids walked through the door. His face spoke for itself. The look on his face was priceless. Yes, it is too late, my dear husband. I am eternally grateful to Mr. Brown for bringing this to my attention. Just so you know, the video he'll give me should be enough to activate the post-marriage contract we drew up last time I forgave you. Tracy turned her head to look at her bed partner. 
In my detached state, I lazily wondered why. Was it the fact that he was a serial cheater, or was it the news that their financial plans were now thwarted? My house has had the locks changed a long time ago. If you want to come by in the morning to get your stuff, it'll be in the dumpster I'm going to hire this afternoon. Throughout this tirade, poor John stared in horror at his feet. I found out later that he was the one who seduced Tracy, but the test drive was her idea. In fact, his plan was to tell his wife and family the next day. He looked longingly at his wife, then glimpsed the children, but couldn't look them in the eye for long. Jenny was losing control of herself, but came to her senses briefly. Well, kids, if you've ever wondered what a whore looks like, take a good look. Tracy cringed under their gaze. Jenny grabbed the kids and ran out. I walked over to the bed and growled at the shrinking couple. Just get out of my house. You have no idea how furious I am right now. I'll be back in two hours or so. I want you both gone when I get back. One look at my face convinced them of the seriousness of my intentions. I ran after Jenny and detained them before they left. We agreed to meet at a coffee shop, which we did. We comforted each other and tried to guide the kids through the upcoming process. Robert turned out to be an adult beyond his years and helped calm his sobbing sister. I really wish her father was here to see his daughter's pain. I gave Jenny my card and offered to help her in any way I could. I think we parted as friends. The next week was really hard. Yes, I can shut off my emotions in a critical situation. However, that doesn't stop the pain. It only postpones it. Of course, I was busy with work and lawyers. They were very interested in my testimony, especially the tape recorder I pulled out from under the bed. It recorded some pretty decent conversations in which the two lovers detailed their plans to take over most of the two families' marital property. Tracy justified it as her right because of my earning power. Of course, the position in divorces was equal, but my lawyer informed me that judges had a way of getting away with it, and evidence of pre-planned fraud could often sway them. Linda insisted on listening to the tapes, too. We were both stunned by her mother's planned vindictiveness. Linda called her mother for an explanation, but got nothing to convince her that it wasn't just pure evil. I made a brave face for Linda and a brave voice for my son when he called, but it wasn't easy. The next weekend after the show, I got a call from Jenny. She was very happy to mow her own lawns, but had no idea how the mower worked. After a few lessons on Sunday and doing other minor maintenance work, I was invited to stay for dinner. We chatted as the kids went to bed. Then things got serious. How are you, Jenny? About as well as can be expected, Dave. Thanks for asking. I think I've been mentally preparing for this for years. Deep down, I knew it would happen again. My lawyers found out what he planned to do with our finances and blocked the whole thing. I couldn't believe that little asshole was going to leave us practically penniless. Asshole. My lawyers tell me I'll get the house, alimony to me and child support, plus 90% of the assets thanks to the evidence we have and the post-wedding agreement. Glad to be of service, Jen. My attorney said something similar, but only about 50-70% of assets. He came by two days ago begging for alms. I think his lawyers were telling him the same thing as mine, and the thought of being raped terrifies him. I told him to back off. My only concern is the effect on the kids. Sarah is at the age where she can develop normally without a father, but I worry about Rob. I know, Jen. At his age, a boy needs a good, strong role model. I've been thinking about it. Could I volunteer for this job? I would be honored to come into his life and help in any way I can. Jenny was silent for a long time. I could see the conflict on her face. Hmm, I know your ego must be a little vulnerable at the moment, Dave, so I don't quite see how. Don't worry about it, Jen. Rob's support is all I can offer at the moment. I could see the look of relief on her face. We discussed the details for a while. What about you, Dave? Are you okay? I don't know, Jen. I'm still a mess. I don't know what I did to make her hate me so much. Finding her with your John just emasculated me. It makes me question my own manhood. Was I so inadequate that I just don't know? The destruction of her relationship with her children, her father, possibly our mutual friends combined with her firing, just doesn't seem enough. I only feel like half a man. Believe me, I know exactly how you feel, Dave. Jenny stared at me, obviously reasoning with herself. Finally, she continued, You know what you need to do to regain your manhood, don't you, Dave? 
Jenny leaned toward me with a steely gaze. Yes, yes, Jen, good. How comfortable are you with me, Jen? There was steel in her voice now, too. Hell really doesn't have the fury of a woman scorned. As far as ridding you of your demons, Dave, you're too good a guy to let some lingering pain ruin your whole life. Let it all out, Dave. All right, I'm gonna need an alibi. You'll have one, trust me. When she told me what she had in mind for an alibi, we both had a long laugh. God, I needed that. We resumed our conversation. This conversation is only half over. What about you, Jen? Do you feel like you need to get back at Tracy? Good God, no. I know what a smooth-talking little prick he can be. Your poor wife never stood a chance. I almost feel sorry for her. We parted as friends, and she promised to talk to Rob about whether he was interested in helping restore my old car. That set the plan for the next six weeks. After school, he would come over to my house and we would mess around. I took every opportunity to talk to him and we became friends. After I drove Jenny home, everything changed. I used my free time to spy on the happy couple. With their bank accounts frozen, John and Tracy couldn't get their own place. Tracy was staying with one of her few remaining friends. Shithead was doing the same with one of his own. They spent most of their evenings together and then split off in different directions late at night. Eventually, I established a clear enough pattern to call Jenny on Thursday night and announce that the next night was the night. She arranged for the kids to go to her parents' house for the night. I drove up to her house and parked in the driveway. Then, after kissing her on the lips, I rolled John's old motorcycle out the back gate and started it up a block from her house. Once at his buddy's house, I looked around, then quietly fired my air pistol into a streetlight. After that, all that was left to do was wait in the bushes on the side of the driveway. He surprised me by breaking the routine. He arrived 40 minutes later in a cab instead of a car. The reason became clear when I saw his unsteady footsteps coming down the driveway. He was drunk. Now, a low blow was never in my nature. My sense of honor demanded a fair fight. I stood up to him. My lawyers found out what he planned to do with our finances and blocked the whole thing. I couldn't believe that little asshole was going to leave us practically penniless. Asshole. My lawyers tell me I'll get the house, alimony to me, and child support, plus 90% of the assets, thanks to the evidence we have and the post-wedding agreement. Glad to be of service, Jen. My attorney said something similar, but only about 50-70% of assets. He came by two days ago begging for alms. I think his lawyers were telling him the same thing as mine, and the thought of being raped terrifies him. I told him to back off. My only concern is the effect on the kids. Sarah is at the age where she can develop normally without a father, but I worry about Rob. I know Jen. At his age, a boy needs a good, strong role model. I've been thinking about it. Could I volunteer for this job? I would be honored to come into his life and help in any way I can. Jenny was silent for a long time. I could see the conflict on her face. Hmm, I know your ego must be a little vulnerable at the moment, Dave, so I don't quite see how... Don't worry about it, Jen. Rob's support is all I can offer at the moment. I could see the look of relief on her face. We discussed the details for a while. What about you, Dave? Are you okay? I don't know, Jen. I'm still a mess. I don't know what I did to make her hate me so much. Finding her with your John just emasculated me. It makes me question my own manhood. Was I so inadequate that I just don't know? The destruction of her relationship with her children, her father, possibly our mutual friends combined with her firing just doesn't seem enough. I only feel like half a man. Believe me, I know exactly how you feel, Dave. Jenny stared at me, obviously reasoning with herself. Finally, she continued. You know what you need to do to regain your manhood, don't you, Dave? Jenny leaned toward me with a steely gaze. Yes, yes, Jen, good. How comfortable are you with me, Jen? There was steel in her voice now, too. Hell really doesn't have the fury of a woman scorned. As far as ridding you of your demons, Dave, you're too good a guy to let some lingering pain ruin your whole life. Let it all out, Dave. All right, I'm gonna need an alibi. You'll have one, trust me. When she told me what she had in mind for an alibi, we both had a long laugh. God, I needed that. We resumed our conversation. This conversation is only half over. What about you, Jen? Do you feel like you need to get back at Tracy? Good God, no. I know what a smooth-talking little prick he can be. 
Your poor wife never stood a chance. I almost feel sorry for her. We parted as friends, and she promised to talk to Rob about whether he was interested in helping restore my old car. That set the plan for the next six weeks. After school, he would come over to my house and we would mess around. I took every opportunity to talk to him, and we became friends. After I drove Jenny home, everything changed. I used my free time to spy on the happy couple. With their bank accounts frozen, John and Tracy couldn't get their own place. Tracy was staying with one of her few remaining friends. Shithead was doing the same with one of his own. They spent most of their evenings together and then split off in different directions late at night. Eventually, I established a clear enough pattern to call Jenny on Thursday night and announce that the next night was the night. She arranged for the kids to go to her parents' house for the night. I drove up to her house and parked in the driveway. Then, after kissing her on the lips, I rolled John's old motorcycle out the back gate and started it up a block from her house. Once at his buddy's house, I looked around, then quietly fired my air pistol into a streetlight. After that, all that was left to do was wait in the bushes on the side of the driveway. He surprised me by breaking the routine. He arrived 40 minutes later in a cab instead of a car. The reason became clear when I saw his unsteady footsteps coming down the driveway. He was drunk. Now a low blow was never in my nature. My sense of honor demanded a fair fight. I stood up to him. Hello, John. He froze. Then in the dim light, I saw recognition light up in his eyes. He certainly didn't react the way I expected. Well, they don't call it Dutch courage for nothing. Well, this is the guy who couldn't keep his woman in line. Very bad move on his part. Instantly, my carefully thought out plan of limited attack went out the window. The offended brute pounced. A right punch to the jaw caused him to fall to all fours. Then my memory fogged up a bit. Based on later reports, I kicked him several times in the ribs, stomped his kidneys and shins, and then landed half a dozen apt blows between his legs. Fortunately, my red haze cleared, allowing me to complete the last part of my plan. I picked up his emotionless body and threw him into the middle of the road. Maybe the police would think he was another unfortunate victim of a hit and run. Maybe not. Jenny was eagerly awaiting my return and questioned me about how it had gone. She didn't seem upset that I had disrupted my plan in anger. Upset people don't usually smile like Cheshire cats. When she had all the dirty details, I excused myself to go take a shower and get rid of any potential evidence. I checked for bruises on my knuckles. Everything was fine. My eyes were closed when I felt a cool breeze and then warm skin. A pair of arms wrapped around me from behind. I thought you didn't want this. Fuck what I want. You need this. You got the man. Now you need to get his woman. I turned around and we kissed. God, I needed that. We finally got away from each other. Besides, when the police come to check my alibi, I want to be as convincing as possible. Now finish up and go to the bedroom. Who am I to refuse a lady's request? Still wet, I threw her on the bed. Normally, as a lover, I pride myself on my attention to a woman. Today, there was none of that. I took her as long and as hard as I could. As far as I could tell, she was enjoying it too. I woke up in the pre-dawn light when I felt her slide back into bed. She snuggled up against me. I'm so sorry, Jen. I was really tired last night. I hope you weren't too disappointed. If that was you in second gear, God help me when I get your third. I then gently made love to her a few more times. After that, we both dozed off again. I woke up when breakfast and coffee arrived. Hey, Dave, some jerk broke the back window of your car last night. I already called the police. Sure enough, the police came and my number was entered into their system. It was soon linked to a report of a possible assault last night. It was very convenient that my alibi and I were together in a house that smelled of sex. A curious neighbor confirmed our story that my car was parked there at the time of the attack, as it had been several times a week for the last while. I was never a serious suspect. I saw Tracy one more time, about a week after her lover's bad night out. She called and said she was coming by to pick up the rest of her things. When I explained that everything had been donated to charity, she said she still wanted to talk. When her car pulled up, I looked out the window and saw Tracy standing next to her car talking on the phone. I opened the door in my robe when she finally knocked. She frowned at my choice of clothing, but my face gave nothing away when I invited her in. I took my phone and purse, carried them to the spare room, and closed the door. 
She was smart enough to guess that I suspected she might try to record this conversation. We sat down on either side of the kitchen table. Dave, you should know that I made a deal with my friend, that if I didn't call within 60 minutes, she would send the police here. I nodded in response to her wise precaution, but remained silent. There was only one thing I needed to tell her, and it could wait. Dave, can I just say how sorry I am that our marriage is over? Save your breath, Tracy. I have absolutely no interest in sitting here listening to you try to salve your conscience by justifying why you tried to destroy me. Okay, Dave. You're the one who beat up John, aren't you? I did. It took her by surprise. She obviously expected me to deny it. What? What's so hard to understand, Tracy? You asked me if I beat up an asshole, and I said yes. It was me. But why? He never did anything to you. Look, Tracy, extramarital sex can't screw up your brain that fast. When I saw you spread your legs for him, it completely emasculated me. It shattered my male confidence. It made me doubt my ability to satisfy a woman. It robbed me of my pride. She was shocked. I don't think she'd ever considered that aspect. That's what it means to cheat. After a while, I realized I had two choices. I could be a sad, lonely old man like your father, a useless, empty carcass, or I could fight my way out of the corner you and your lover have driven me into. Does it really surprise you that I chose the male option, the only option that will allow me to remain a man? Is that so? Yes, I destroyed your boyfriend, and if I feel it's necessary so I can hold my head high, then I will do it all over again. You forced me into this, Tracy. There can only be one survivor. To prevent you and him from destroying me, I must destroy you both. The words were spoken with such calm, chilling certainty that they left no room for doubt. Boo. But John and I just fell in love, Dave. We couldn't help it. You remember being in love, don't you? Yeah, Tracy, I remember eight weeks ago. Like I said that day, it may not have been your choice to fall in love, but it was your choice what to do and how to do it. If you had just come to me and said, Dave, I've fallen in love with someone else, I want a divorce, then I would have been sad, but I would have gladly given you your freedom or fought to win back your love, whichever I chose at the time. By declaring your intentions the way you did, viciously and cruelly, you declared war on me, betrayed everything I stand for and everything I thought you stood for. What now, Dave? Can you leave John and me alone now that you've had your revenge? Yeah, I think I can, if only because I can't think of anything else to destroy. Thanks, Dave. Don't worry, Tracy. I'm not the one you should be worried about. Eh? I got my revenge on Johnny Boy. His wife hasn't gotten to you yet. I'd keep an eye on her if I were you. I can tell you she's a very mean lady. At that moment, a woman's voice came from the bedroom. Are you coming back to bed, Dave? You promised me six times a day and you haven't delivered yet. Who's that? It's Jenny. She ran off screaming. I went up the stairs to a fully clothed Jenny. She held me until the shivering stopped. As for Tracy, she flew off somewhere far away. I never tried to find her or contact her again. Like I said, my name is Dave, and I feel fine. I read somewhere that some people who take revenge on those who have wronged them find it an empty experience. Pig's ass. That's the most effective cure for depression I've ever heard of. Fuck it. It's time to stop dwelling on the past. I have a new life ahead of me. Jen and I never became a couple. We used each other to ease our frustrations pretty regularly, but lacked the necessary spark to move on to the next stage. But we were good friends and cared for each other. Under our joint guidance, things worked out for Rob and Sarah. I backed off when potential boyfriends were around her and stayed out of her bed until their relationship ended. One or two of them were a little scared of me as I told them that if they hurt her in any way, they would have to answer to me. Before the last one proposed to her, he even asked my permission. He was a great guy, and I happily blessed their union. The wedding was very emotional. Her father left, and she asked me to walk her down the aisle. At the wedding, she introduced me to an old friend of hers. With my Jenny and self-therapy, I have become balanced enough to have a normal relationship, and am now considering asking Jenny to marry me. Well, why not? If it wasn't for the payback I put on the two crooks, would I have recovered enough to lead a normal life? Hell no. My name is Tracy, and for the past two years, my life has been hell. I think I can justify what I did back then. However, it's much harder to justify what I did last week. Looking back, I realize that my life with Dave was good. However, it has become stale. 
The only thing I have left is my first granddaughter. So when John started showing interest in me as a woman, I felt like a teenager again. He was attentive and caring, and what can I say, he swept me off my feet. In the back of my mind, I knew something was wrong with us, but it felt so damn good. Our relationship followed the usual pattern of talking, dating, kissing. I don't remember guilt ever being an issue. By the time we crossed the line and kissed, I already knew I loved him and he loved me. We planned to leave our spouses and get married. My friend Carol, who had gone through a difficult divorce, explained that her ex had taken over all the assets from the beginning, and it was very difficult for her to even hire a lawyer. That's why John and I quietly took control. I didn't know how his wife would react, but I was pretty sure my Dave would not be happy. We had often talked about what cheating was, and I realized that I would be out of line before John and I even announced our decision. I fully intended to give Dave whatever the court required after the divorce. I just wanted to be in the driver's seat and protect myself from any retribution. Carol also asked if I had slept with John. I had never particularly enjoyed making love, but a girl has to think she's still woman enough to be sexually attractive. I knew my husband still found me that way. He demanded that I hug him quite often. If I had the same spark for Dave that I had for John, this whole mess could have been avoided. Anyway, Carol planted doubts in my mind. What if John had a tiny buddy or would only last five seconds or something? When I needed sex sometimes, I wanted it to be good, didn't I? At my stage of life, sex was more of an emotional thing than a physical thing. I didn't expect John to be as good as Dave. Dave was attentive, gentle, and filled me up nicely. This is what spawned my latest catastrophic betrayal of my marriage. Thus, my first encounter with John was a double exercise, one to test him and the other as a final bonding exercise to steal myself for the emotionally demanding tasks we had planned for the next few days. Frankly, I wanted to capture John's attention so he wouldn't give up on our plans. Even then, I suspected he was a pretty weak man, had I ignored the possibility of being caught and Dave freaking out? Did I think about how it would affect my father and children? The simple answer is no. I never expected to get caught, and if I did, I never expected Dave's nuclear response. As for the rest, I just didn't think about it. I never compared myself to my mother. I was so young when she left us that it just didn't enter into the equation. After all it cost me, I wish I could say that sex with John was mind-blowing, but it wasn't. His buddy wasn't tiny, but he wasn't of Dave's caliber either. It lasted a decent amount of time, but seeing that I was dry after a few minutes, it only made it uncomfortable. I caught myself pretending to be happy, just like I did with Dave. I still have no idea how Dave found out about my one and only cheating. It just didn't matter to me. I was devastated when I saw the hurt in his eyes when he walked into the room. Later, I tried to justify myself to myself, but of course I couldn't. He had never done anything bad enough to warrant it. My guilt manifested itself as disobedience for a very short time, but it didn't last long. The thought of my father witnessing my misbehavior and my daughter's words were just killing me. The look on John's daughter's face was almost as horrifying. I had no idea my husband was capable of such cruelty. When I got the call from the hospital about John's hospitalization, I instinctively knew it was Dave's doing. The doctors thought John's broken jaw, concussion, bruised kidney, three broken ribs, cracked tibia, and shattered groin were consistent with an accident. That's not what I thought. That's why I called the police and gave them Dave's name and license plate number. But when I called back two days later, they said Dave was not a suspect. That's why I stayed with John all week while he was in the hospital. I knew he needed my protection. Until two months ago, if you'd asked me if my Dave was capable of this, I would have said no way. Within 15 minutes in my old bedroom, I glimpsed a new one, Dave's monster. The monster I knew I had created, a monster more than capable of boundless cruelty. Yes, I just knew it was Dave. That's why, just before John was discharged, I called Dave and arranged to meet at our old house. This shit had to stop. Hadn't he gotten his revenge yet? John and I were both destroyed. We needed to face it. I was sad to walk to my front door, not as sad as I expected from the upcoming conversation. How had I gone from loving a man to thinking of him as an enemy in such a short time? Before ringing the doorbell, I called Carol and told her to call the police if she didn't hear from me in an hour. The door was opened by Dave in a robe, unusual. 
There was no expression on his face as he invited me in. When he asked me to hand over my phone and purse, I scolded myself for not thinking to bring my voice recorder. Then I asked myself why. He would never admit to the assault. I quickly glanced at the stranger I had known for over 27 years. I felt remorse for the way our marriage had ended. By explaining how I fell, I hoped to ease his pain and maybe get him to back off a little. He shut me down as soon as I started, said he wasn't interested in why. His tone was harsh and his expression blank. Who was this guy? I didn't recognize the face or the voice. I was stunned when he nonchalantly admitted to beating up John. When I heard his motivation, I realized why he did it. Let's just say it did nothing to assuage my conscience. I genuinely didn't understand why Dave hated John so much. He, of course, was very quick to put that thought in my head. I suddenly realized how self-centered I had become. It blinded me and allowed me to rationalize the completely unacceptable. I suddenly realized not only what we were being punished for, but that judging by the look on Dave's face, there was more to it. My question of whether he remembered what love was was part of my prepared speech. His answer was like a knife stabbed into my stomach. How else could a decent man feel? I knew I had to run. I didn't realize John's wife was a physical threat until I heard Dave's words. With a flash of insight, it was suddenly as if I was in her shoes. What would I do if she did to me what I'd done to her? A chill ran down my spine. When I discovered she was upstairs, I ran. I picked John up from the hospital and we both ran. Both divorces were finalized. The papers were delivered to our mailbox located two towns away from my new home. The stress of living anonymously with no friends and constantly looking over my shoulder was overwhelming. Eventually, we had some money. The waiting was hard. Six months later, John and I were married. Looking back, we were two shipwrecked people thrown together, and that was a mistake. I also think one of the motivations was that by getting married, we could retrospectively justify the pain we had caused many, especially ourselves. My most recent fall started innocuously enough. John's only remaining testicle never worked. He was completely unable to get an erection. We could never afford the course of testosterone treatment needed to alleviate this problem. This caused him to be cranky, insecure, and jealous. Let's face it, a marriage rooted in infidelity is an uphill battle from the start. His nagging also made me very unfriendly. A friend of mine recommended ZHT therapy to me. She had cured her similar condition that way. I quipped about the likely cost, but she explained that since every other woman over 45 was treated, it was much cheaper than testosterone therapy. One more visit to the doctor, and like magic, my life returned to a happy normalcy. My doctor warned me that one of the side effects of estrogen pills is the revival of my libido. He said this with a smirk, as if it was a good thing. However, when it happens to the wife of a man with erectile dysfunction, it is very devastating. I felt more horny than I ever had after the first five years of my marriage to Dave. John dismissed my pleas for oral sex and masturbation, which would have helped. I quickly learned to hide vibrators from John. They just caused him something shocking. When a guy at my new job started showing interest in me, I couldn't help but respond. He was much younger than me, and it was very flattering. Hiding our dating was extremely difficult. The insanely jealous John was much harder to fool than Dave. The first time we kissed, I felt like I'd been electrocuted, not from excitement, but from a strong sense of deja vu. I refused to go through it again. I refused to cheat. I thought long and hard, but I finally came up with a solution. It was far from perfect, but John had to respect my motives, didn't he? So I sat John down on Thursday night last week and told him as gently as possible that I wouldn't be home on Friday night. I have a lover to meet. I'll be discreet. It's just sex and I'll never rub his nose in it. I took his silence Thursday night and Friday morning as reluctant agreement. After treating me to dinner and a disappointingly short sex session, my new lover fell asleep. Embarrassed, I went home to the trailer where John and I lived. He wasn't there. The wail of sirens at dawn alerted me to the fact that he was hanging, swinging from a tree. I did it again. Destroyed the man. I prepared myself for the payback I knew he had orchestrated. I was surprised to find that it consisted only of a suicide note and a letter to his lawyer. So the suicide note was emailed to all of our remaining friends who immediately dumped me. The letter to his attorney was to change the beneficiaries of his insurance policy and his will from me to his children. When will I learn? Never touch a man's pride.